we're going to start talking about complexities of threading. So I just motivated some reasons why you would want to use threading. And we talked about leveraging hardware and software advances, improving performance, being able to improve responsiveness, and simplifying program structure. But there's also a dark side to this stuff. So not surprisingly, even though some things may get simplified, other things become more complex. And it's kind of like, um, like whack-a-mole. You, know, you whack the mole, and it goes down in one place, but it pops up someplace else. So we're going to talk about what the complexities are of software and some ways you can address them. We're going to start off by talking about so-called accidental complexities. Accidental complexities are things that arise due to self-inflicted wounds, things we bring on ourselves, uh, usually by using the wrong types of tools, the wrong methods, the wrong techniques. So one classic accidental complexity that a lot of people have used historically is they've tended to program concurrent applications and networked applications, for that matter, using very low-level APIs, typically written in C, that were tedious, error-prone, and non-portable. So it's like you know, trying to mow your lawn with a push lawnmower, which is very environmentally conscious, but will take a long time and it will be very painful. Or trying to take notes in the class with a stone you know, tablet and a chisel. So here's an example of a low-level API. This is the pthreads API. You can actually find the implementation of this in Android if you really want to hurt yourself and go see how it all works under the hood. So this is a program that's going to print out Hello World in a separate thread of control. So there's a main program. We do a little bit of funky things. And then we call this method called pthreadcreate. And we pass in a pointer to a function, which is fraught with peril for various reasons due to type checking. Uh, and then we cast the parameter here to void star. And whenever you find yourself using a cast, especially in C and C++, it usually means something is broken. So just like in real world situations, casts equate something broken, right? And then you have to cast the void pointer back into a, a param star. And, and all kinds of bad things can happen here. Uh, the handle that's created by calling uh, pthread create is just an unsigned integer of some kind. So it's easy to get confused and pass the wrong type in here. And of course, the minute we start writing our code to use pthread, it's not going to run on Windows or VXWorks or other operating systems. It's, it's very centralized to POSIX. Lest you think I'm picking on pthreads and POSIX, every C API that exists has this problem. It's very hard coded. I wrote a paper over 20 years ago talking about this issue, and it's still true today. OK, so that's one problem, low-level APIs. Now, obviously, people using Android and writing Android apps in Java circumvent a lot of those problems, right? We're not writing at the pthreads level. We're writing in Java as opposed to C and C++. And what's happening under the hood is Android's runtime layer, this thing here, is using something called the wrapper facade pattern, which is a pattern described in the POSA 2 book that I co-authored a number of years ago. And it basically encapsulates data and functions provided by existing low-level C APIs with more concise, robust, portable, maintainable, and cohesive object-oriented classes. I won't go into the details of what all that means, but the long and the short of it is uh, you can read about it here. And you don't have to worry about these lower level accidental complexities. They are hidden from you. So that's good. Of course, not all the complexities disappear. There still are accidental complexities that occur at a higher level of abstraction in Android. For example, there's a number of these design constraints, which you can read about. So one we've talked about before, application not responding. So if you don't you know, if you are in the user interface thread and you don't return within a certain amount of time, you get this, you get this uh, dialog popping up seeing if you want to shut your program down. Non-user interface threads can access the UI toolkit. And the mechanisms that Java gives you, which we will cover, by the way, and which we're using, so threads, monitor objects, semaphores, re read-write locks, those kind of things, those don't solve the problem either because they're meant as general purpose mechanisms for concurrency. And they don't know anything about these more specific Android platform constraints. They don't know about this UI thread issue and the fact that you've got legacy toolkits that are not thread safe and so on. So as we'll see, pattern-oriented frameworks are going to make this problem go away. There are other problems, which we'll cover here briefly, that are also due to accidental complexities, really stemming from the fact that we often use tools for debugging our applications that are relatively primitive for a variety of different reasons. If your program is correctly written, 
and it's functioning properly. It's a concurrent program that's functioning properly and is well written is a thing of beauty. It's just wonderful. But unfortunately, when things go wrong, how do you figure out what's gone wrong? So the analogy I always think about is, you know, back in the day before we had modern medicine, when you weren't feeling well, what would they do to you? Right? They might, you know, apply leeches or bleed you or drill a hole in your head with uh, trepanning, <coughs> which is a really freakish thing where they would try to let the evil spirits out, right? So how do you drill down and find out what's going on? Well, what makes it hard to drill down in concurrent programs is that the very act of trying to debug your program in a debugger may change the behavior of the program. And this leads to something that's called a Heisen bug, where the act of observing a system can <laughs> alter its state, right? So there are certain things that happen when you're in the wild. Your programs will do things in the wild that they don't do when they're caged up in the debugger, right? You know, in the wild, they, they eat you, right? In, in when, which is actually what you want, because you want to find out things are going wrong. <laughs> when you're debugging, everything seems to be fine, right? Not a problem. I can't see the problem. So this divergence between actual behavior in the debugger and or the debugger behavior and actual behavior is different. That makes certain things hard to fix, timing problems and so on. Some solutions, which I'm not going to go through in detail, but you can read about here at this article, this very nice article in Dr. Dobbs' journal, which is largely focusing on C and C++, but the techniques apply to Java. Um, obviously, knowing concurrency patterns, so not putting stupid mistakes in your program in the first place is a good place to start, right? So that'll help a lot. Um, and there's concurrency patterns you might look at. Code reviews, getting help from your peers to point out where your code has problems, right? So getting teams, you know, teams of people to gang up in you and force you to find your mistakes, that's, that's actually very effective but somewhat expensive. Uh, and trace buffers, which is a very common technique you guys can use. There's different degrees of doing this. Some of the things involve, you know, using stuff like logcat, which is what you do, or other lightweight ways of being able to kind of keep track of things so that you can go back later and then analyze why your program is going awry. So different techniques you might look at. Okay, the last piece of the puzzle here, and then we'll take the quiz, is the lack of tools that support the identification and remedy of race conditions. Does anybody know what a race condition is? It's where when you have two things trying to access the same thing, it might produce two different values of the thing, which gives the kids to a Right, it's something where the, the order, um, where the order of events, hey, influences the correctness of the output. And typically what happens and why we have a, a smash up car uh, image is that a race condition is when multiple threads crash into unprotected data and screw them up. To really do this right requires more than just code reviews and um, you know, log tracing and patterns. You really need to have advanced methods and tools based on static and dynamic analysis. And we don't have time to go through them in this class at this point, but there's some really cool stuff. Uh, we wrote a paper a couple years ago that kind of gave a survey of a bunch of different approaches. There's some open source tools and commercial tools that will help you even with Android code, something called Flashlight from a company called Sure Logic, that is really nice to be able to instrument your code and figure out where problems are occurring and so on. So the key thing to remember about this is that d detecting the problems in your code related to concurrency <coughs> Quality assurance is not an accidental complexity. It's really more of an inherent complexity of building software in general. But failing to use the right tool is an, ac an accidental complexity. So a good example of this would be um, characterized by the phrase pound wi or penny wise but pound foolish, where you do something that seems to save you some money up front, but actually you're spending a lot more money down the road. So um, those of you in 251, not using Valgrind is a great example of an accidental complexity. Because remember all the things that you did that would be found by using Valgrind. Not using Valgrind, silly thing to do. There's no reason not to do it. Also, and this is more for commercial development, not using the best tools that can find these problems. A lot of people say, oh, it's, it's going to cost me $100 a, a seat to buy this fancy concurrency analysis tool, and then I'll have to learn it. I don't want to do that. I'd just rather you know, debug my program. Well, you know, $80,000 of debugging time later, that $100 tool probably would have saved you a lot of money. So figuring out how to get the right return on investment is important.